uh, so I'm talking today about software aging and software rejuvenation. Maybe my interest in this is because I'm myself aging and I would like to rejuvenate myself if I can, I suppose. But uh, so it's a fairly interesting topic and I'm going to uh, run through it uh, through these many different bullets. First, very quick introduction and motivation. Then this phenomena of software aging. And then what I call environmental diversity and uh, software rejuvenation. And then we'll conclude and give some references. And of course, I uh, uh, entertain questions al along the way. I may not always answer the questions, but you can ask the question anyway. And if there's a very tough question, I will say good question. And that's the end of it, you know. And so uh, now I am a member of a working group of IFIP 10.4. Which, was a, which is on dependable computing. And an umbrella term called dependability has been involved in that working group. And it is defined as the trustworthiness of a system such that reliance can be justifiably be placed on the service it delivers. And uh, dependability tree then was created. And uh, it has three branches and corresponding sub branches. The three branches refer to First branch refers to attributes of dependability. Second branch refers to the means to achieve high dependability. And third branch refers to threats to dependability. What makes dependability bad? So threats to dependability are classified into false errors and failures. Means to achieve dependability are classified into fault prevention or fault avoidance, then fault removal, fault tolerance, and fault forecasting. In this talk, we'll be dealing with fault tolerance and fault forecasting. And then the attributes of dependability initially were availability, reliability, safety, and maintainability. And they added security later. I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm only uh, constraining myself to these two, reliability and availability. So first, these two attributes of dependability that are of concern to us, reliability, uh, uh, refers to continuity of service or the probability that the system operates without a system failure throughout a given interval of time. By contrast, availability refers to readiness for service or the probability that the system is working when needed. It may have failed earlier, but so long as it's working right now, I'm fine. Whereas in the other case, it has to be working throughout the interval like for a, a, a flight, um, flight control system of an aircraft during a flight, for instance. So given that initial, uh, let's now a uh, very important distinction to be made between false error and failures. Now, of course, different groups have different terminology, but it is good to stick to a particular terminology, which is what I'm going to do here today. My definition, which is based on the IFIP working group 10.4 definition, a failure occurs when the delivered service no longer complies with the desired service. So either you get a wrong answer or you get no answer. That's a failure of the system under consideration. And failure may arise because there are some errors in the internal state of the system, which may propagate to give the wrong answer or no answer at the output. And the error may be caused by a fault or a bug. So in the context of software system, fault is a bug. Now, bug by itself is not necessarily a problem until and unless it is exercised by the right set of inputs or workload, which may give rise to some wrong bits in the system state. And this is an error. Error by itself is not necessarily a problem. It may be overwritten, but once in a while, it might propagate to produce a wrong answer or no answer. So fault may give rise to errors, which may give rise to failure. And the dot, dot, dot indicates that the concept is hierarchical or recursive in the sense that failure of a subsystem is fault at the higher level. So fault, error, failure. Now, it, is, it can be observed from data that is uh, seen in real life that hardware fault tolerance, fault management are relatively well developed. And what we are observing more and more are outages due to software failures in, in systems. 
Now, as we know, there are four means of achieving high reliability and availability. One is fault avoidance or fault uh, prevention. So fault avoidance can be exercised through good software engineering practices, formal methods, and so on. But in spite of all the techniques that we have developed, we find that the number of bugs that we have in the large complex software systems is non-negligible, it is quite large. And we should continue, of course, to exercise these methods to reduce the number of bugs. But as of today, we have a lot of bugs after we produce uh, our, our uh, software. So the next technique that has been advocated is fault removal. You find and fix bugs through testing. Now, in spite of all the uh, testing that we do to remove faults, we still find that the number of bugs in the software during operation is quite uh, reasonably large. So we have buggy software, whether we like it or not, that we are operating on. So key challenge then is to have reliable software operation given that we have software with a lot of bugs. So the potential solution then is the third means, which is called software fault tolerance or fault tolerance in general, in our context, software fault tolerance. Now in the, this is a, my grand granddaughter probably will do this to me when she gets older. Uh, now software fault tolerance was pondered over in 1970s. And uh, the researchers at that time concluded that using identical copies of software for fault tolerance did not make sense. Unlike, and this is different from hardware fault tolerance, and people continue this idea that software fault tolerance is different from hardware fault tolerance. And we're going to differ with that in a little while. And the notion was that if a software fails under some workload, it's identical copy, which is exactly the same bugs, will also fail on this workload. Even if it is on a different hardware, whether it's a, uh, the other copy is on the same hardware or different hardware. Therefore, uh, they concluded that software fault tolerance should be based on uh, not identical copies, but diverse copies using what is called design diversity, design diversity. So the idea of design diversity was to, uh, to design multiple versions of software to the same specifications. And to, in order to do that, uh, you might be encouraged to use different algorithms for these different versions, different programmers, uh, use different design or programming languages, use different development testing methods, and so on. In order to minimize the probability of the same bugs in these multiple diverse versions, so as to minimize, uh, the, um, increase the uh, mutual independence with respect to bugs. So this idea was very popular and it is very well documented in papers and books. And uh, there were two different ways, two principal, there are many others, but two principal different ways of utilizing these diverse versions. So one method was uh, from University of Newcastle upon Tyne, Brian Randall's group called recovery block, which in the context of hardware fault tolerance essentially uh, amounts to standby redundancy. So you have a primary version and a secondary uh, standby version, secondary, tertiary, et cetera. If the first one the primary doesn't work, then you go to the secondary and so on. Alternative method was developed uh, advocated by UCLA, a Louisianist group, which they call N version programming, and which corresponds roughly to the K out of N redundancy in the hardware context. But these methods are used, or have been used only in safety critical applications, primarily because they are too expensive. Actually, one version of software is expensive enough to produce. Now, being asked to produce multiple versions makes the cost uh, double, triple, et cetera. So these methods have not been used extensively except in life-critical, safety-critical applications. 
So these classical techniques based on design diversity and specifically recovery block and inversion programming are expensive and used mostly in safety critical applications. But we do have stringent requirements of failure free operation in other applications, which are not necessarily safety critical enterprise applications and so on. So what is needed then is affordable software fault tolerance, not the expensive software fault tolerance that has been well documented and in books and so on. So what can be this uh, possible answer? And this is what we have been calling environmental diversity as opposed to design diversity. And one aspect of environment, environmental diversity I'm talking about today, there is another aspect that uh, can be talked about some other time. So before I can bring the idea of environmental diversity, I have to bring in the notion of software aging. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the aging phenomena, software aging phenomena. So common, this is contradicting the common notion. It is commonly believed that unlike hardware, software does not age. We know hardware ages, but people believe that software does not age. Well, there was a paper in 1995, a seminal paper that has shown that software does age. And if you examine a little more detail, you find that it is the environment in which the software is operating that degrades with time of execution. And this behaves uh, in a way that software appears to age. So there are, there are two papers around the same time published in the literature. In 1994, there was a paper by David Parnas, very well-known software engineer. And in 1995, there was a paper from Bell Labs, Wang, Kintala et al. Uh, on uh, software aging and rejuvenation. The notion of software aging published in David Parna's paper corresponds to uh, the fact that over a long period of time, software systems have many upgrades, bug fixes, changing requirements, and so on. And after a while, it becomes so difficult to maintain, so difficult to handle that uh, you might say software is aged. This is one kind of software aging. The second kind of software aging is what we are talking about, where degradation with respect to system resource usage and more of a system problem uh, rather than a software engineering problem, if you will, and was originally called process aging. So this is the kind of aging we are talking about. And uh, this software aging phenomena is that long running software tends to show performance degradation and an increasing failure rate and was originally called process aging. And it actually, there is no real deterioration in the software itself, but it behaves as if it is aging. So we may, we may call it software appears to age. And it is not related to the application program becoming obsolete due to changing requirement maintenance. That is Parna's view of software aging. We are taking the Bell Labs view of software aging. So we are speaking of software aging on a small time scale of the order of hours, days, or months at most. Whereas Parna's notion of uh, software aging is over a large time scale of the order of years. So aging phenomena that we're talking about corresponds to or uh, demonstrates itself as errors accumulating over time of execution of the software system. And this then leads to performance degradation or increasing failure rate. And main causes of such a behavior may be listed as memory leaks, storage fragmentation, unterminated threads, accumulation, accumulation of round of errors, unreleased file locks, and so on. So the resources of the operating system tend to disappear in a black hole uh, with the time of um, uh, execution. And it has been observed in just about every uh, major software system. Uh, but most interesting one uh, was in Patriot Missile Defense System during the 1991 Gulf War, when uh, an incoming SCUD was not recognized 
and uh, some people died. And that uh, incident was analyzed and it was concluded that it is a uh, type of um, software aging. So the 1995 paper is a seminal paper from Bell Labs. And my student Sachin Garg at that time noticed that paper and brought it to my attention. And I liked the paper very much. And I, I ended up calling uh, the authors at Bell Labs and uh, then suggested that my student Sachin Garg come over there uh, during the summer and uh, actually show uh, by measurements the aging in software systems. And uh, so in 1996 summer, uh, Kin uh, Sachin Garg went to Kintala's group um, uh, and uh, with the idea to show software aging via monitoring real system. Now, if some of you who may know, I, I'm a, I used to be a pencil and paper guy. So this is the real departure for me. I don't know what came into my mind. I want to show by real monitoring uh, the uh, aging taking place in real systems. And so he went there and started the uh, experimental setup. And it turned out that summer was not long enough to complete the experiments. So after he came back, uh, he continued and set up the uh, ex uh, experiment in our lab here at Duke. And uh, data collection was done uh, with this experimental setup. There were nine uh, machines being monitored and one machine that was a monitoring machine. Now, these are the old days. These are all Sun Solaris boxes. And this is IBM AIX box that I was monitoring. And each of these nine machines were uh, monitored uh, at every 15 minute intervals and 100 different variables were being collected from each of these machines. And these variables amounted to something like real memory free, process table size, file table size, et cetera, and system activity like CPU usage, paging, swapping, NS, NFS, et cetera, for 10 minute intervals, not 15, minutes, over three months. So a lot of data was collected from these nine machines. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you only some data. So let's look at from one of these machines, the file table size. The dots are the real values measured from those machines. And what we see is a trend. Trend is that the file table size increases with time of execution. This is the day of execution, 50 days and so on. Similarly, the real memory free, the, uh, the trend is that the real memory free decreases. So each of these resources will be, will be having some ceiling. So after some time, you will reach a ceiling and system will crash. In the meantime, system will slow down because it takes longer time to uh, get the resource that you need. So this was the first demonstration of uh, software aging taking place in real systems. And this paper was published in 1998. I think it has got some award, I guess. And so we define uh, the notion of a bug, which is called aging related bug or ARB, a bug that leads to an accumulation of errors either inside the running application or in system context environment, resulting in an increased failure rate and or degraded performance. And there are many, many examples given in many papers um, that uh, can be seen. Okay, so uh, there is also a lot of work on uh, fundamentals of software aging. So if the bug is sitting here under some aging factors, the bug can be activated to produce an error and this error accumulated uh, may propagate to uh, produce a failure. So what are the potential methods of dealing with faults, errors, and failures arising from this phenomena of software aging? So this is a sort of a master chart, if you will. So we can uh, try to talk about fault prevention or fault avoidance. So in this context, it will be that if you write code without any dynamic storage allocation, then at least one type of bug uh, can be uh, avoided. And this is sometimes used in uh, flight critical software and real time systems that they will not do any dynamic storage allocation. But that doesn't mean that all bugs due to software aging will go away, but large number of them might. might. The second idea is to remove faults. 
Now, so there is special set of tools developed to uh, detect and remove aging related bugs. And there is a whole uh, chapter written on this in one of the books. The next thing is to, uh, we have these bugs and during operational software. So when the failure occurs due to this software, uh, you can carry out reactive recovery after the failure, reactive after the failure by restarting or rebooting or failover to an identical copy after the occurrence of failure. So this is fault tolerance because you're doing time redundancy. You're not necessarily fixing the bug, but simply restart or re reboot. And proactive or preventive recovery can also be done. That's called software rejuvenation. More about this in soon. And we also, the fourth uh, means of achieving uh, high dependability is failure fault forecasting. This has been used in two different ways. I'll show you briefly to schedule software rejuvenation. And second, which I will not show you, is to be able to predict what modules in your overall software system are prone, more prone to um, aging related bugs so that you can do testing for aging related bugs only in those modules rather than in all the modules. So now we are ready to talk about environmental diversity as opposed to design diversity. So we know that restart and reboot are uh, useful after a failure that occurs due to software aging. Now we know that restart and reboot have been used to deal with hardware transient or intermittent faults for all the time, but do they help in dealing with failures caused by software bugs and without fixing these bugs? And if yes, why? That's the question to be asked. And uh, the answer to that question is that, um, is that uh, uh, this counteracts the software aging effects, namely by freeing up operating system resources and remo removing ground of error accumulation. And the bug is not most often removed, although it would be nice if you can find and remove it, but the system is expected to work after restart or reboot because uh, time, this is time redundancy based fault tolerance via what we call environmental diversity. And what is meant by environment? Environment is an underlying idea of environment. And this, uh, this idea is that uh, environment where the application is executed is changed enough by the restart or reboot. And environment is understood as the operating system resources that in, within which the application is working and other applications running concurrently sharing the same system resources. So it is the resources of the operating system that constitutes the environment. And by restarting or rebooting, I'm changing the environment and uh, or resetting the age of the software, if you will. So this is fault tolerance since we do not necessarily fix the fault or cause a failure. And this failure is dealt with using time redundancy because you are re-executing uh, uh, re, um, the application after the restart or reboot. And user may not experience the failure again on retry because environment is changed. So I have named it environmental diversity to contrast, with, contrast it with design diversity that is well known. Okay, so now let's look at a little bit of a model of the system. And uh, my animation doesn't always work very well. <laughs> uh, so we have uh, consider a very simple two-state semi-Markov availability model of the system in which uh, the software system is working while it is in state A. And uh, in, it may fail after some time due to, we are talking about software aging related failure, and it may then be uh, recovered by means of restart or reboot. Uh, this is reactive recovery, environmental diversity based re reactive recovery. Now, this simple two-state semi-Marco model, there's a very simple solution for the steady state availability, which says MTTF divided by MTTF plus MTTR. So in order to compute the availability of the system, I need to have the mean time to system failure and mean time to re reactive recovery. 
this is very easy to find. For this, we need to collect the data uh, of, of the past times to failure from which we can then estimate the uh, mean time to failure. So now we are ready to talk about software rejuvenation. So we know that for hardware components or systems that are subject to aging, it is common to carry out preventive maintenance to improve their reliability or availability. Since software is also now known to age in the sense that we described, preventive maintenance is also uh, useful, can also be useful for a software system to improve its reliability or availability. In the context of software system, his original 1995 paper uh, coined a very nice uh, name for it, named software rejuvenation. So preventive maintenance in the context of software system has this very nice name, software rejuvenation. By the way, if you type software rejuvenation in a search engine, more than likely you will find some of my papers, but you will also find reference to um, this Ayurvedic massage treatment spas that you find in Southern Indian state of Kerala. I don't know why that's called software rejuvenation. It's rejuvenation of the body, but somehow uh, try to type software rejuvenation in the search engine and you will find those Kerala sites too, as well as some of my papers hopefully. So traditional software fault tolerance, design diversity-based software fault tolerance, we said that it's expensive, not used much in practice, and we need to uh, find affordable software fault tolerance. So second idea of affordable software fault tolerance then is proactive use of environment diversity, and which is what we call software rejuvenation. Software rejuvenation. So it's a proactive technique to counteract software aging effects to prevent or postpone failures and slow down performance degradation. It's a proactive rollback to a clean state. And the potential actions, proactive actions, may be a garbage collection, defragmentation, flushing of kernel or file tables, application or service restarts, VM or VMM or OS reboot, et cetera. And once again, it is rejuvenation of the environment. We are not doing anything to the application software itself but it is called software rejuvenation. Thus it uses environmental diversity because we are cleaning up the environment and we're providing a diverse environment to the application to execute in after the action of rejuvenation. And this has been implemented in many different systems. In telco originally, space systems, defense systems, web services, cloud services. And there are some examples here. Patriot missile defense system that I mentioned uh, in 1991 Gulf War, it was actually known that every eight hours you had to switch off and switch on the system. So this is rejuvenation. But uh, somehow that information was not followed by the operators in 1991 Gulf War. That's why the accident occurred. It has been implemented in many other ISS and uh, many other places. And uh, originally, as I said, in at and then onboard preventive maintenance of long life deep space missions. And it turned out that in around 2000, we helped IBM uh, X series. Uh, so my uh, group together with IBM uh, group uh, implemented this, helped implemented this in X series uh, uh, in um, IBM X series. And we also conducted a uh, detailed survey of what all companies use software rejuvenation. It may not be under that name, but that idea is used by most companies and in any case, patents have been issued by just about every major company on this notion. Again, the name might be slightly different uh, than, than that. So there's an interesting paper of uh, now dated, I suppose, 10 year old, but uh, so it may need to be rejuvenated, the paper itself. And uh, this are uh, the set of plates from the real implementation that we helped IBM uh, with in uh, around 2000. So now, software rejuvenation, what are the advantages? It can reduce costs of sudden aging-related failures. You're doing an action before a failure occurs and can be applied at the discretion of user administrator 
or can be automated. But what are the disadvantages? There is a direct cost of carrying out rejuvenation. Plus there is a cost of, when you perform rejuvenation, there is a downtime that you, you introduce and decreased performance you introduce, or perhaps lost transactions. So uh, you don't want to do too much rejuvenation. You don't want to do too little rejuvenation. So important issue is to find optimal times to perform rejuvenation. So there is a lot of work on that, but I'll propose a very simple three-state uh, semi-Marco model to carry out uh, this optimal uh, computation. And as somebody said that little bit of math can help a lot. As I told you, these ideas have been implemented by a lot of people, but they use seat of the pants method. They don't use this little bit of math. If they did, they will improve their system behavior quite a bit. So I would urge all those people who are using it to uh, look at some of these uh, efforts that we have had and improve their behavior of the system. And those who are not using it should try to use it now. So, uh, scheduling of rejuvenation, broadly speaking, can be divided into two, uh, two ideas, time-based and inspection-based. And to explain this in the um, modern and the practical context, changing oil in the car, you normally do before the failure occurs because failure means that engine will have to be uh, redone or something like that. So it can be done based on a time that is every six months, you do uh, oil change, or uh, you actually uh, uh, look at the um, dipstick and see if the, um, inspect the dipstick and see if the oil is dirty or oil is low. If oil is low or dirty, then you change the oil. So there may be a threshold, uh, or you may try to predict, uh, inspect every once in a while and try to predict when the oil will go low after how many months or whatever. So let's first look at the time-based rejuvenation. So time-based rejuvenation, there's a very simple three-state uh, model that I've uh, developed here. So system is up and running, and after some time it may fail, and this is reactive recovery. On the other hand, you may trigger a rejuvenation after some deterministic time and carry out rejuvenation. This is proactive recovery or rejuvenation. So of course, when you are in this state, you are down. And you are in this state, you are down. So you want to balance. Uh, what you want to try and do is remain here as much as possible. Very rarely go here because it's traumatic, perhaps, to have a failure due to aging. And so you want to determine uh, what is the trigger interval that is optimal. It turns out that all you need is a mean time to carry out this, mean time to carry out this but you do need the distribution function of the time to failure in order to determine the optimal rejuvenation trigger interval. So we can measure times to failure to parameterize the semi-Marco availability model and then fit the measured data to and so-called IFR, increasing failure rate distribution such as Weibull, and then use the model to find optimal rejuvenation schedule. Equations are given in several of papers and books and so on. Now, it, it may be that to collect this measurement offline, it takes a long time. So to speed up the measurements, ideas from hardware reliability theory can be used, namely accelerated life testing and accelerated degradation testing to speed up the measurements and collect the data to find the distribution function of time to failure. And uh, these papers, uh, that we have published with uh, Matias, uh, Rivalino Matias Jr. from Brazil, are probably the first use of uh, these techniques borrowed from hardware reliability in the context of software reliability. There's also another interesting idea from hardware reliability theory that can be used, which says you do not need to fit the data to any distribution. You can directly use the data, sequence of uh, time to failure data to compute the optimal uh, optimal um, um, trigger for software rejuvenation. Now, so all these ideas are there in the literature, but I don't think people are using in practice. Uh, this little bit of math will hopefully, uh, once uh, understood or implemented, will help them improve the system behavior quite a bit. Quite a bit. Then let's consider the inspection-based 
uh, inspection-based methods. So in the inspection-based methods, we are going to measure the performance variables or system variables that may consider to be health of the system. So for example, for our, us human beings, somebody has decided that measuring A1C and keeping track of the A1C sugar level or uh, H, HDL and LDL cholesterol levels, uh, keeping track of them, how they are growing or staying within bounds or not. These are healthy indicators of the human being. Similarly, we have to develop the health indicators of software systems to try to figure out uh, what causes, uh, uh, what determines whether the system is behaving well or not. And, and then we need to predict the time to exhaustion of resources or time to failure of the system. That is one way to take the measurements. The second way to take the measurements is when the certain measurements reach a certain threshold, then you will trigger rejuvenation. So either prediction-based or threshold-based. Now, uh, we have found out that a lot of uh, um, patents have been filed on prediction-based rejuvenation, but I don't know anybody actually using it. So once again, people are afraid to use mathematics in real, real systems somehow. And uh, very first measurements that we took, as I said, in 1998, we developed from that methods of computing uh, or uh, predicting the time to exhaustion of system resources. For example, in this particular uh, uh, machine called Rossby, from the time measurement started, uh, after some time, we determined that it, it will take about 162 days for the real memory free to exhaust. So within that time window, you should do rejuvenation uh, to avoid system failure. And similarly, many other resource file table size, we predicted it will take so many days for exhaust, process table size, et cetera. So each resource separately, we have uh, developed methods to com compute the time to exhaustion of that resource. And subsequently, many other efforts have been done uh, to try to uh, improve the prediction of time to resource exhaustion. Uh, for example, ARMA, ARX, time series methods, uh, non-parametric uh, methods, non-linear models, principal component analysis, pattern recognition methods, and machine learning approaches. All kinds of approaches have been used to try to better predict the time to exhaustion of resources so that uh, we have a window over which we can carry out rejuvenation based on these inspections. The last uh, topic in this is that, what is the granularity at which you should carry out your rejuvenation? Should it be at the lowest level application component granularity or the application as a whole or virtual machine on which your application is running or virtual machine monitor or the operating system as a whole or the physical node? And so, uh, and the overheads of doing all this have been studied, but a lot more is necessary. So now to conclude, uh, software rejuvenation deals with software availability and reliability in the operational phase during the system in operation. Most work on software reliability deals with software during uh, production or in testing phase. What we are talking about is during operational phase. Software rejuvenation has been adopted as a good design practice for many systems and possible to adapt ideas from hardware reliability. You know, old adage that software is different from hardware should be now changed. We can learn and adopt a lot of techniques from hardware as we have shown here. And as failures due to uh, software aging are a low hanging fruit. And uh, ideas that we have advocated here are almost universally applicable. And uh, we learned that apply a little math, little math can help a lot. And this has potential to be even more widely deployed than it has been already. And uh, uh, recently handbook has been published by us in 2020. And this is what it looks like, handbook of software aging and rejuvenation. And there are three editors. Tadashi Dohi from Japan in Hiroshima, myself and Albert Tobritzer from New Jersey. And um, what is more to be done? Uh, this is a partial list. Optimal rejuvenation scheduling 
with multiple levels of granularity. Uh, what we have described is only single level of granularity and multiple level of, levels of granularity makes a lot of sense. And combining that with the modeling and optimization of when to trigger rejuvenation. Uh, it should be studied as an online feedback control problem. Some initial work has been done, but a lot more work is necessary. Methods of deciding what are the key performance variables to monitor that will determine the health of the system. Some work has been done, but a lot more is necessary. Methods of predicting not just individual resource exhaustion, time to resource exhaustion, but prediction of the time to failure due to many different resources acting together. Prediction of ARB prone modules to help testing. Some initial work has been done, but a lot more is necessary. And rejuvenation can also be and has been used in the context of cyber threats or attacks. Again, uh, some work from Johns Hopkins has been done, but a lot more needs to be done. Uh, there is an interesting area in hardware reliability called prognostics and health management. And uh, connection between software aging and rejuvenation are obvious, but need to be exploited a lot more. The same person uh, um, working in these two areas is necessary in order to uh, benefit both. And deeper study of what we, what we now call bore bugs, Mandel bugs, and aging related bugs is necessary. And again, some has, is, uh, has been done, but a lot more is necessary here. Uh, I have, I've drawn this uh, material from uh, papers listed here, primarily the original, uh, so original paper, 1995 paper, and then uh, our first, uh, our paper on detection of aging. And this is the paper that deals with uh, without fitting the data. And you can compute uh, the optimal rejuvenation schedule. This paper describes the implementation of uh, rejuvenation in IBM X series with uh, IBM researchers and my team. Uh, this, is a, this is a very interesting paper that needs to be exploited. I don't think a lot of people are following up. It's a very interesting paper. This is a experimental um, uh, paper of uh, dealing with Apache web server uh, aging. This is the accelerated life testing used in the context of software systems. Uh, this compares different granularities in the overheads of uh, rejuvenation. And this handbook uh, is sort of more or less the current state of the art in this topic of software aging and rejuvenation. And there are more recent papers such as, um, uh, uh, this is the uh, prediction of ARB prone modules. Then this uh, talks about uh, rejuvenation, two level rejuvenation, not just one level, two level reju rejuvenation in Android smartphones. This also talks about multi-granularity software rejuvenation. Uh, this is the survey of uh, what all companies do use uh, in software aging and rejuvenation. This is um, uh, software aging and, and rejuvenation in cloud. Uh, this is software aging and rejuvenation in software defined networking and so on. And I have worked with large number of different people from many different institutions, uh, Sachin Garg and Kalyan, Vedyanathan uh, were my students here. Michael Grotke and Javier Alonso uh, and Rivalino Matias were my postdocs here. Um, and uh, Leili was a student here. Eh? Antonio Puliafito. And uh, these people were visiting me from various different institutions. Um, and this is the uh, most recent PhD from Technical University of Munich, essentially my student, but graduated from Technical University of Munich. She now works with Google. So with that, I will close and uh, ask for any questions.